Well, as we've been working our way through John's gospel, we got into that section of John in chapters 14, 15, 16, where Jesus is giving them his uh, exposition, understanding on the gifts and the working of the Holy Spirit. And we said that basically the Holy Spirit works in three specific ways in the life of a believer or someone who's coming to faith. Remember that? The first way in which he works in that Greek preposition, it's called what? Para, para, where the parakaletos, the Holy Spirit, comes alongside. Para, to come along. Kaletos, called. The Holy Spirit is called alongside by God to come alongside the believer to help them see who Jesus really is. And then when they do, come to the realization that we're all sinners, aren't we? All of us, desperately in need of His grace of the salvation that only he could offer, right? And we come to that place where we surrender our life, then the Holy Spirit comes to dwell in, in, E-N, like the English word in. Now, when we have the in experience of the Holy Spirit, what does he provide for us then? What is the action that is taking place? We display the fruit of the Spirit. The end experience of the Holy Spirit, where the Holy Spirit comes to dwell within you, should produce spiritual fruit. And that spiritual fruit is really described in one word. What is it? Love. 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 The way of God is the way of love. Love. And so that's what we need to focus on as believers, first and foremost, is allowing the Holy Spirit to work through our life to produce the fruit of the Spirit, which is primarily love. And who should experience that fruit more than anybody else? The person we're closest to, our neighbor, right? Yeah. And Arlene, it is your birthday today, isn't it? I looked on the Realm post, and I am absolutely amazed how good you look at 122. (laughs) Because it says on Realm that you were born this day in 1900. (laughs) I said, surely that can't be true, or there's a miracle taking place in our midst. Ah, but nonetheless, as I'm saying, that an experience should produce the fruit of the Holy Spirit, and the person who should experience that fruit more than anyone else are those closest to us, right? If I can't be Jesus and allow his fruit to be displayed in my life, in my home, in my marriage, in my relationship to Gail, then I have no business trying to be it anywhere else, do I? No, no. First and foremost, that fruit should be in your home, in your closest relationships. But then we said the, the next experience of the Holy Spirit when we are yielding to him and surrendered to him and allowing him to produce the fruit that comes forth out of our life, then he gives us the epi. And what does the epi provide? Power. The epi provides the tools that, that are necessary for the work of the ministry. We call those the charismata numetica, right? What do we call those? Spiritual gifts, spiritual gifts. And the spiritual gifts are given for the purpose of fulfilling the calling for which God has upon your life, the calling of ministry. When we talk about ministry, it's simply your, your service or being a servant of Jesus Christ. We were in the book of Jeremiah on Saturday mornings, gentlemen, and Jeremiah was rescued from that pit. Remember, he was thrown into the cistern, thought he was going to die there. They were throwing stones on him, mocking him. But then a man came at night and rescued him out of that pit. Remember his name? ebed Malek. Don't you remember? ebed Malek. What does it mean? Servant of the king. And that's what it means to be in the ministry. We're just servants of the king. Isn't that true? Yeah. And so we've been talking about the gifts that God would give for the sake of fulfilling the ministry that he has upon our life. We focus on the fruit, and as we're focusing on the fruit and allowing the Holy Spirit to love through us, then he'll give us the gifts that we need to accomplish the calling that he has upon our life. Unfortunately, too many people have it upside down, like your bulletin this morning. (laughs) Maybe you didn't notice. So, So many of you didn't look at your bulletin this morning, did you? You didn't? Look at your bulletin. It's upside down. (laughs) And so they have it upside down. They're focusing on the gifts. And what's the one primary gift that they talk about more than any other? Tongues. Glossialia, right? Glossialia, tongues. Now, Paul tells us that tongues is what? The least of the gifts. The least in importance. Now, you heard us singing in tongues this morning, didn't you? A known language, right? for which you have no experience or understanding of, but we gave you the interpretation at the same time. So we exercised the gift of tongues, and we had the interpretation. Isn't that wonderful? (laughs) (laughs) And so we started looking at tongues last week. I mean, we started looking at the gifts of the Holy Spirit last week, and where did we go? 
Well, good. Some of you remember. We went to 1 Corinthians chapter 12, and we went through the chapter because Paul is describing the gifts that are described there. Now, as I said to you last week, all of the gifts that are described for us in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 or Romans 12 or 1 Peter 3 or Ephesians 4, it's not an exhaustive list because these are the acts or the works of the Holy Spirit in and through our life. Now, we're not going to be in 1 Corinthians this morning. Where are we going to be this morning? Romans 12, Romans chapter 12. So turn with me there. When you're talking about spiritual gifts, right? The charismata pneumatikon. When you talk about spiritual gifts, you're going to go to 1 Corinthians 12, or you're going to go to Romans 12, or you're going to go to Ephesians 4, or you're going to go to 1 Peter 3, I think it is. And that's where you find a description of the spiritual gifts, primarily in Romans and in 1 Corinthians. But again, as I said, the Holy Spirit distributes the gifts of the Holy Spirit or the actions of the Holy Spirit or the empowerment of the Holy Spirit as he wills in quantity, in type, right? It's totally up to him. And there are many, many, many gifts that the Spirit would give for the sake and the purpose of ministering to others. Always, always, every single gift but one is for the purpose of you loving someone else. Every spiritual gift for the purpose of you ministering to others. The only self-serving gift is what? Tongues. Tongues is the only self-serving gift. That's why it's called the... Are we to serve self? No, we're to serve others. Others, right? All right, so turn with me to chapter 12 of Romans, and we're going to walk our way through there this morning. Can we pray one more time? Yes. Father, I do ask that uh, beyond my, my study, beyond my experience, beyond my knowledge, Lord, I pray that you would give the epinosis, Lord, whatever is necessary, Lord, for the edification, exhortation, and the comfort of these, your children, Lord, my brothers and sisters. And so I pray, Father, that you would speak to each of us right now, particularly in these first two verses, Lord the absolute necessity for every one of us to surrender our life to you in total. In total, not in part, Lord. But help us, Lord, to surrender all of our life to you. We know that cannot be accomplished without your enablement, Lord. We're selfish. We're self-centered. Lord, my preoccupation most of the time is with myself, Lord. Forgive us. Help us, Lord, to be more centered upon you and upon others, living an others-centered, Christ-like life, Lord. We pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So here he says, I beseech you, I beg you, brothers, you therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, wholly acceptable to God, which is your reasonable service. And do not be conformed to this world, but be ye transformed by the renewing of your mind, that you may prove what is that good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Now, we talked about each time that spiritual gifts are spoken of, whether it's in Romans or 1 Corinthians or later on in Ephesians, the first purpose, as he describes, is the unity that the Holy Spirit desires to give. There'll be a diversity of gifts, but it's all for one purpose, purpose bringing us to the unity of faith as believers. One body. There's only one body, one church, right? Yeah, I was invited to a celebration yesterday, and I went, and, and there was a, a, a group of people there, the predominantly a group of people were from the Korean church, and they kept saying, my church, my church. I said, no, no, there's one church. And I kept over-repeating that over and over again. Finally, they got it. There's only one church, right? One body, one faith, one baptism, one Lord, one church. Is that true? Yeah, yeah, yeah we're all part of that one body. So the purpose of spiritual gifts is always to bring us to unity. Now, we, we demand unity on what? The essentials. On the essentials of the faith, we demand unity. And that essentials are normally comprised of what we believe with regard to Jesus Christ, who he was, what he has done, what he's accomplished, and he's coming again. Amen? Now, when it comes to the non-essentials, we offer liberty. You're free to believe whatever you want to believe on the non-essentials. Unity on the essentials, Liberty on the non-essentials, but in all things, charity, love, love. We can agree to disagree, can't we? Yes. Yeah, you can be wrong. <laughs> <laughs> 
<laughs> no, that's audacious, isn't it? No, no, no. But, but when you interpret the non-essentials, and there's so many non-essentials in the scriptures that we read about, it should never bring division, right? Just as the diverse working of the Holy Spirit in the life of the believers, right, should never bring division. I may not have the spiritual gifts you have, but you don't have the spiritual gifts I have, but they're working in harmony together to complement one another, right, for the purpose of bringing the whole body to unity. Never division. Hmm? Yeah, and so that's what he wants to present here first. But he's talking about surrendering your life. In verse 1, he says, I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God, that you present your bodies a living sacrifice, that you're to be a holocaust unto God, a burnt offering, right? Jesus offered himself as a burnt offering, as a holocaust. The word holocaust means burnt offering, if you know something about the Jewish faith and this sacrificial system found in Leviticus. The burnt offering was unique from every other offering in that the entire sacrifice was to be consumed on the fire, on the altar to God. That's why Jesus' death was referred to as a holocaust. And it's interesting, isn't it? That's what they call the attempted genocide of the Jews there, World War II, a holocaust. Hmm. Your life, my life, is meant to be a holocaust. A burnt offering offered unto God completely without reservation. No area of my life should be off limits to God and to the person of the Holy Spirit. Do you understand that? Do you believe in the priesthood of all believers? Yes? yes? What do you understand about the priesthood of all believers? All believers are meant to be priests unto God, right? What did the priests do? The, the priests offered and officiated in the sacrifices that were offered unto God. Now, there is a sacrifice that only you can offer to God, that no one else in the whole world can offer to God. Only you can offer that sacrifice to God. And in that way, we believe in the priesthood of all believers. What sacrifice might that be? Myself. Myself. And this is precisely where Paul brings us to the very beginning of his exposition on the gifts. First and foremost, you need to offer yourself to God in total, complete. So the question you have to ask this morning is where? Where haven't I let God in? Where I, haven't I not allowed the Lord to experience lordship salvation in my life? Everybody wants fire insurance, right? Right. right. Nobody wants to burn for an eternity. But the problem is most don't want lordship salvation. They don't want the Lord to be lord of their life. In total. If he's not Lord of your life in total, he's not Lord of your life at all. Do you understand that? And this is what Paul is bringing us to that understanding. Now, how many of you really want to offer yourself as a living sacrifice to God, a holocaust unto God, a burnt offering unto God, that your entire life will be consumed for him and his purposes and his will? How many would like that? Not everybody. How does that get accomplished? How does that happen? It's in the book. This is an open book test. I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the... The only way you can do it. Listen, the, o the only way you can do it is if God gives you the ability to surrender your life to him in total, but he will. As you purpose to commune with the Lord, the stronger your communion with the Lord, the more you sacrifice everything to him. Hmm? What percentage of the church tithes? Oh, stop it, Pastor Rich. Just stop talking about that. <laughs> Does God need your money? No. Do you need to give your money to God? Yes. Why? Because he's testing you. It's just, it's just a test. Money, money means nothing. We are all so rich considering all the people that have ever been born on the planet of the earth, all the people that have been born, all the people that ever will be born, it's just a very small remnant that ever come to know Jesus Christ for who he truly is and experience that gift of salvation, that treasure, right? Last week we talked about the hope chest, right? Do you have that hope in your chest? You know, most of you young people, you don't know what that is, do you? Hope chest. It's something that an that a engaged woman would have as she's preparing for her wedding and she put all these treasures in that hope chest for her and her husband to be as they live their life together. And so we call it a hope chest. I said, now what the hope do you have in your chest? And then Pastor David mentioned to me the last time he taught for me while I was absent, he talked about what we should treasure in our heart and our chest becomes what? 
a treasure chest, a treasure chest. Now, how can that happen? Only, listen, only as we commune with him, and the more we commune with him, the more we realize we can trust him, the more faithfulness he displays in our life, the more faithfulness he displays in our life, the more we surrender and yield. You won't surrender to anybody you don't trust, right? Yeah, Mike trusted me not to say anything about his birthday today. I didn't say a word about your birthday today, did I? No, they did. But the more we experience the Lord, the more we commune with the Lord, the more we trust the Lord, the more we trust the Lord, the more we surrender to the Lord. Now, how is it we commune with the Lord? Through prayer and through the study of his word and experiencing him through the fellowship of other believers, right? That's how we experience the Lord. I, I don't see the Lord physically. I don't hear the Lord audibly. I can't touch the Lord, no. But how do I experience the Lord right now? Through you. Through his church. That's how I experience Jesus. And then I know more of him through his word. And through prayer, I have a stronger communion where I open up my heart and my life. It is so hard to open up to people, especially for men, isn't it? We don't like to open up to people. We don't like to just air out everything. about. You know, I don't mind sharing with you things I've gone through. Because I'm through them. But boy, when I'm in the process, don't even talk to me about it. I, I, you know. But my wife has a wonderful gift of being able to draw it out of me, you know. And I'm able to open up because I, I, I trust her. I, I trust she won't violate my heart. She won't violate what I'm sharing with her, you know. And so the same thing is true with God. As we read his word and as we get into prayer, we learn we can trust him more. Mm. And it's so wonderful to have that handful of very faithful friends in life that we can trust, isn't it? Amen. Yeah. So I beseech you, therefore, brethren, by the mercies of God... As Philippians says, work out your salvation with what? Fear, Fear and trembling. <laughs> right? But what does he say right after that? But it's God who works within you, both to will and to do, according to his good pleasure. You don't have, listen, admit it. You don't have the desire. You don't have the ability. But God gives both. We work it out with fear and trembling. What does that mean? We cry out to God, please have mercy upon me, O Lord, a sinner, and change me. Change my life. Change me from the very core of who I am, Lord. Make me love. And he will. And that's how this is accomplished. Now listen to me. If you truly don't want to be a sacrifice, you won't be. Because he knows. He knows. He knows that little precious. What's the precious? That little idol in your life that you don't want to give up, that you don't want to surrender to him. Right? So he knows if that exists there, you're not ready. But he knows when you are really willing to lay your life down on an altar for sacrifice. The Akada. What is the Akada? The, the binding of Isaac. You see, from the Jewish perspective, from a Jewish mindset, and it's so important you understand the, the Bible from a Jewish mindset, from a Jewish perspective, because it explodes with meaning. The Jews always emphasize, emphasize not the sacrifice of Abraham, but the willingness of Isaac to lay down his life. Abraham was an old man at this time, right? How old was Isaac when he offered his life? He was in his 30s. He wasn't this little boy like you see in the Sunday school stories. No, he was well into his 30s and he could easily have overpowered his father. But Isaac offered his life, laid down his life. God never meant to take Isaac's life, but he meant to be a display uh, for our learning. Who did he represent? Jesus Christ, who laid down his life for his father to accomplish the father's will in the redemption of those whom he loves. Isn't that wonderful? Now, if you're not here, the rest of what I have to say this morning doesn't mean anything to you. He cannot empower a servant you understand that? He will empower you with spiritual gifts that you need for the work of the ministry, the calling that he has upon your life when he knows you're surrendered. That's why it begins here with you offering yourself. And as you offer yourself to God more and more, and it, it, it's progressive, isn't it? It doesn't happen all at once. But throughout your walk with the Lord, you know that you're offering more and more and more of who you are to him. 
And then he's empowering you all the more to do the work of the ministry, not for your vain glory, but for whose glory? For his own. He says, don't touch the glory of God, right? And do not be conformed. Conformed? What is conformity? It's, it's falling in line with your leader or whatever group you're identifying with. It's the outward pressure of the world forcing you to become what they want you to be, pressing you into a mold that they have for you. And boy, that pressure's never been more uh, in existence than it is today, isn't it? What do we call that today? Woke. Woke. What does woke mean? Yeah. It means a variety of things, but basically it's, it's, it's anything that comes in opposition to the diversity and, and, that, and the acceptance that they're having with regard to the acceptance of everything that is an abominable to God. Isn't that amazing? The wokeness of today. Why are so many companies, so many big, major companies in America succumbing to the wokeness of today? What pressure? Money. No, no, no. It's not so much what you give to them. It's what they can get from these major international banks that are demanding their compliance, their conformity to the wokeness. But who's behind it all, really? Satan. Satan Satan is. Now, you've got to be very, very careful not to let the outward pressures of the world conform you to the world. That could be the worst thing that could happen to us. And so much of the church today, Christian, yeah, with the emphasis on the, yeah, they're conforming to the world. They are. They're being assimilated into the world. How many now are completely acceptable of that which God says is detestable? Too many. many. Far too many. Don't be conformed, he said, but he said, be ye Transform This word transformation, it means that the Holy Spirit has the power to change you, not from without, but from within. within. There's a transformation that takes, from out, uh, takes place from within as you offer yourself and yield yourself to God. I hope that if you've been walking with the Lord any period of time at all, that the people closest to you can say, wow, you really are changed. You really are a child of God, aren't you? Yeah. And that's what they should be able to say because they could be able to give evidence of the fact that there's an inward power taking place, creating an inward change in you. It's not within you, is it? It's the Holy Spirit. Precisely. And that word transformation, what is that word in the Greek? Yeah, it it is where we translate into the English word metamorphosis. Where is the metamorphosis described or explained for us or exemplified in nature? Yeah, what you said. <laughs> you take this ugly caterpillar, right? This ugly little creature with his oh, thousand legs crawling on the ground, you know. Can't look up more than a couple inches, you know. <laughs> and, and he tries to live the way Gail wants me to live, eating grass and, and salad all the time. <laughs> you know. Right? <laughs> But one day, one day this caterpillar willfully crawls up a tree, willfully gets out on a branch, out on a limb, (laughs) risk, willfully risks everything to wrap itself in silk, to wrap itself in what only God could provide. And then what happens on the inside? It dies. It surrenders its life. It yields to whatever God wants it to be. And then that, that miracle of that metamorphosis takes place where it liquefies. And then suddenly, suddenly it begins to change. And it's not what cocooned initially, is it, that breaks forth. When you're planted into the ground, when Paul uses the analogy, the agricultural analogy of planting corn in the ground, when it refers to the resurrection of the body, he says, you take a kernel of corn and you put it in the ground, right? What springs forth? One big kernel? (laughs) No, something entirely different, right? Something far more glorious. This, this stalk begins to develop and you got this stalk of corn and I was, I was watching something the other day and this man was riding through this cornfield and this corn was far above his head. 
And there were multiple ears of corn on every stalk and upon every ear, hundreds of kernels of corn, far more glorious than that single kernel that was put in the ground, wasn't it? That caterpillar that liquefies, that offers itself, that dies, breaks forth into a beautiful, gorgeous monarch butterfly. And what freedom, right? Before, mm, mm, but now, flight. And some of these monarch butterflies, you know they fly from South America, South America to here? It's amazing the distance that they can travel. It'll be amazing when you finally see who God has created you to be, what a miracle it will be. But we can begin to allow that change to take place, that transformation, that metamorphosis, and it happens, begins in our minds, doesn't it? Look what it says here. Chapter 2. And do not be conformed to this world, but be transformed by the renovating of your mind, renewing of your mind. Unfortunately, too many Christians today, they're mindless. It's all about their experience, experience and emotions, right? Hmm. How, do, how did the Pied Piper get all those rats to drown themselves in the river? <sighs> wow. You need to pray that some of these Pied Pipers that are out there, they're producing good music. It's just not of the spirit. But it's moving to the soul, soul, not the spirit, the soul of man. And unfortunately, it's leading people into bad doctrine places they don't need to go. Who was the first worship leader? Satan. Satan. Is that true? Yes. yes. Where in the Bible is that? Ezekiel 36, 36. 28. Very good. Well, You're close. <laughs> <laughs> yes. His, he was most gifted of all of the angelic creation. And he was gifted to provide the music of heaven. Isn't that amazing? Hmm. So we need to be careful. But he says here, the renovating or the renewing of your mind, your thinking, you see. You've got to think. You can't just feel. If you just feel, you're going to be led astray because your feelings will take you in a very wrong direction. You understand that? Amen. And so that's what he's saying here. We need to be thinking people. Now, I know, you know, if you're new to the chapel here, I teach for an hour plus, hour <laughs> But I know that most people who come in here, if you're visiting with me, you're used to a, a, a Christianette sermonette, right? You're used to 20 minutes of a feel-good experience, and then away you go. And it's all emotionally driven. It's all your new experience and feeling so good about yourself. Well, I'm not here to make you feel good about yourself. <laughs> I'm here to ask you to let the Holy Spirit make you actually be good, righteous, holy. Hmm? Yeah. And so that's what he's talking about here, the renewing of your mind. That's, that's why I decided on Wednesday night, I really want to give you an exhaustive study on eschatology. We've been looking at pneumatology. What's pneumatology? <coughs> study of the Holy Spirit. So we've been looking at pneumatology since we broke into chapter 16 of, of John. And we'll end that this week and go back to John. But starting Wednesday night, I want you to have a thorough understanding of what eschatology is and the differences of interpretation and why those differences are there. And you know, it's unfortunate, but so much of it has to do with an attitude towards not just Jesus now, but an attitude towards his people. Who are they? Israel, Israel the Jews. Amazing, amazing. But the renewing of your mind that you may prove, that you may be tested and show and display what is the good and acceptable and perfect will of God. Pastor David described that, how beautiful it is when we dwell together in unity on the essentials, right? There should be unity on the essentials. How good and how pleasant it is when brethren dwell together. It's as good as it's pleasant, pleasant as it's good. But you know, Paul also says that divisions must come. He writes that in Romans. Divisions must come. Why? To show those who are approved. Doctrine, doctrinal differences, they'll come. But you need to make sure that you understand the doctrine of God. Did you recite the creed and say that Jesus went down into Hades? That can't possibly be true. Is that true? Jesus went to Hades? Yes. Where do you see that in the Bible? Revelation. Luke. Psalms. Acts chapter 2. You don't need to turn there, but, but it's very clear in the sermon that's given there that you, you did not leave the Holy One to suffer corruption while he was in Hades. It specifically states that. 
But there are a lot of people that say that Jesus went down to Hades to be tortured by the devil. He set the captives free when he went down there, didn't he? What captives? Those who believed in the promises of God, you know? So you need to make sure that you're doctrinally accurate in what you believe so it's acceptable and you understand the perfect will of God. And so often, especially when it comes to suffering. We've been very fortunate. For most of the church age and in most places in the world, it's not been safe at all to be a Christian. You understand that? It's been very dangerous to proclaim your faith in Jesus Christ. Here, we have been an exception for almost 300 years. But that's changing, isn't it? It's changing rapidly. But if you were to talk to the brethren in Ukraine this morning who've lost everything and maybe have suffered the loss of those that they love so much, and, and when that happens, you it just it seems like you've been torn open and someone tears out your heart. Well, how do they process that suffering? How do they accept the perfect and acceptable will of God in that? By faith. By faith. Believing God's word apart from their feelings. Believing God's word apart from their circumstance. That all things. What? Yeah. And are called according to his purposes. That never becomes more meaningful than in our suffering. You understand that? Hmm. And so there are times when God purposes a suffering that would take place in our lives for our perfection, for our maturity, and for the well-being of others. But we have to understand it that way, that God does allow suffering. God brings about suffering. And how do you process it? That perfect and acceptable will of God by your surrender. Some of you wear these bracelets. What do the bracelets say? God's sovereignty is my sanity in these crazy, crazy times. And especially in your suffering. The only soft pillow to lay your head on is his sovereignty. That father knows best, right? Yeah. For I say through the grace given to me, to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought, but to think soberly as God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Too many people have a way, way overinflated view of themselves, don't they? And, and what's helped bring that about more than anything else? Yeah, yeah pr pride is behind it all, but the mechanism through which it's really brought it out in the open is social media. Everybody's a celebrity, you know? Look at the number of people that lost their life through an accident trying to get a selfie in a very dangerous position or precarious place, you know? But, but selfies make everybody a celebrity, and, and so often, through all of that that's on social media, it's not the real you, is it? It's the you you would hope to be. It's the you you want to be, but it's the you you're pretending to be more often. Isn't that true? Rather than the, the you that you really are. But the Bible says, I'm to esteem others more highly than I do. So that's maintaining an attitude of humility, right? That's what we should do. Yeah. I'm glad when I spoke last week, I was identified as others. You know? <laughs> yeah, well, one guy introduced me as a turkey. <laughs> yeah, he was right. For I say, through the grace given to me to everyone who is among you, not to think of himself more highly than he ought to, but to think soberly, sound mind, sound thinking, biblical thinking. 2% of parents, what, Nathan? Two percent of parents today teach their children to have a biblical worldview. Only two percent. Ninety-eight percent teach their children to have a secular worldview. Isn't that something? Hmm? Maybe they're part of the ninety-eight percent that don't tie there. I don't know. <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. But God has dealt to each one a measure of faith. Now God gives us the grace gift, right? Of faith to believe, but he also gives us a grace gift of faith to understand. If God has a calling upon your life to be a teacher, then what's he going to do? He's going to equip you with understanding. If God has given you the gift of mercy, what's he going to do? 
He's going to give you such an empathetic, such a sim- sympathetic and a compassionate heart for people, isn't he? So he gives us the measure of faith or the gift associated with what he has called us to do. Verse 4, for as we have many members in one body, but all the members do not have the same function, so we being many are one body in Christ, individual members of one another. Even though there's a diversity of people, diversity of gifts, we're all one. He's talking about the unity in these first five verses here. This unity we have in Christ. The word university, what does it mean? Unity in diversity. University, that's what university, you have a a variety of disciplines on this one big campus, right, that people study, but they're all united under that campus, right, under that college name or whatever it might be, a university, unity in diversity. Well, that's precisely what God offers us in the body of Christ. Now he talks about spiritual gifts, having the gifts differing according to the grace that is given to us. Who gives you the gift? God. We read last week in 1 Corinthians chapter 12 that the Spirit distributes the gifts as He not according to the way you demand? No, you can't demand a spiritual gift? No, no. It's a spiritual gift. It's a gift given by God that you need to receive into your life. And they begin to exercise for the sake of others. And the more you exercise the gift, the string of the gift becomes in your life. Hmm? But that's what he's talking about here. Can anybody teach you to have spiritual gifts? No. No. You can't be taught the gift of tongues, can you? There's so many, I laugh. If I want to have a good time and just roar, I put on YouTube and I start to look at all of the false expressions of spiritual tongues that are out there. It's it's crazy. It's preposterous. It's it's actually insane, isn't it? You ever watch some of these people? Oh, boy. I'm sorry? I actually experienced it in a church once and it was kind of scary. (laughs) <laughs> have many of you experienced that before yeah the insanity of it all yeah it is and it is insane paul said i'd rather paul said i would much prefer to speak five words five words in a known language so i can teach than what Ten thousand in a tongue isn't that isn't that quite a difference right if you have any question about tongues read first corinthians chapter 14 we're not going to go into that this morning But then having gifts differing according to the grace that was given to us, then use them. If prophecy, prophetia, what is that? The the fourth telling of God's word, not the foretelling of the future. It's the fourth telling of the word of God. That's really what it means. When he talks about using this gift of prophetia or prophecy in chapter 14, he said, I would rather that you all prophesy. Yes, speak in tongues, you know, but I don't understand what you're saying, but I prefer that you would all prophesy. Why? So that you could offer exhortation, edification, and comfort to the believers. It's teaching. You offer exhortation. What's exhortation? It's, it's, it's lifting up. Edification is really the building up. That's an architectural term. Exhortation is you're exhorting them to good, or you're warning them about danger. You know, now not everybody listens to your exhortation, do they? But you are responsible to give it in love, to share the truth in love, right? Truth loving. But this prophecy here is speaking of telling forth the truth of God's word in love for the purpose of exhorting, encouraging you in what is good, exhorting, warning you in what is wrong, right? And then edification, building you up in the most precious faith. And then all of that bringing comfort. Comfort, right? That's what he's talking about here. The gift of prophecy. Let us prophesy in proportion to our faith. Now, as your understanding grows in the word of God, the Bible is self-interpretive, right? Do you believe that this is God-breathed? We call it inspiration, right? Inspired of God. God God-breathed. 40 authors, 66 books, over 1,500 years, and at least three languages, but yet all of it one message. One message is God's love to us. My Bible's falling apart. No, no, don't worry about it. Don't worry about it. I don't need it. No, that's okay. My Bible's falling apart, but my life's not. (laughs) The the more well used your Bible is, the more your life will never fall apart. Right? Yeah. We don't worship the Word, do we? We worship the Lord of the Word. Right? Right? 
Yes, prophesy in proportion to your faith. Or ministry. What is ministry here? Diacone. What? Service. Serving. It's, it's becoming a servant. Now, every single one of us are called to be servants of the Lord. Right? And in serving the Lord, who do we serve? One another. Listen, don't make any mistake about it. Lord, when were you hungry and I fed you? Right after service, I took Pastor Ritt out to lunch. <laughs> I can't do it today. I got a board meeting. (laughs) Lord, when were you naked and I clothed you? When were you sick and I cared for you? When were you in prison and I visited you, Lord? If you've done it unto the least of these, my brethren, you've done it unto me. This ministry, now you understand, you understand being a minister, you know what I'm called to be? The head servant here. I'm the foot washer. I'm supposed to be able to be the one to lower my, do whatever it needs to be done for the good of the body. And so are you, really. We're all called to minister, right? This is the ministry here. It's to serve one another. Let us use our ministering. He who teaches. Now, this is to dedicate. This is to share the truth, the doctrinal truth that's found in the scriptures. Then then teach. He who exhorts in exhortation. We need a lot of exhorters today. There, there's not enough people who exhort people who have the courage to tell people when what they're believing and thinking is wrong. You know, I always ask a person, when I start to talk to a person and they start to tell me what they believe, I'll say, if, if what you believe wasn't true, would you like to know? That's a reasonable question, right? Yep. I'd say, if what if you believe is true, would you like to know? Now, if they say no, I walk away. Right? If they say yes, ah, then we get into the conversation. But I have to ask permission first to exhort them, to explain to them that what they're believing is wrong. Hmm? I, we had a, a uh, question and answer time at the conference last week, and one fellow presented a position that he had on eschatology, and particularly the rapture, and he was going on about what he didn't believe on a particular area. And then when he got all done, I said, I believe that. I mean, I do. You know, it was a non-essential. It's one of those things that we offer the opportunity to disagree but agreeably, right, in love. But I offered an opposing opinion because I, had an oppo- I don't agree with you. I want to give an exhortation, so that's what I did, right? But listen, listen, you need to pray for boldness that when you have those opportunities that you enter into that lovingly. You understand? But do it lovingly. That's right. We're, su- we're supposed to produce <laughs> more light than heat. Before, I used to produce a lot of heat. <laughs> we, get, we get gentler as we get older. I hope, I hope I pray. <laughs> yeah. Exhortation. He who gives. Oh, that's a wonderful gift too, isn't it? Yeah, this affluent society we live in has nothing, done nothing but increase people's greed. Hasn't it? Greed is a terrible, terrible, terrible thing when it gets a hold of your life. You know, that, that lust for stuff. That fire never says enough wood, right? It'll take everything you throw at it. That's the problem with the lust of the flesh. It'll never be satisfied. It never says enough. No more wood. No, no, no. It'll consume everything until nothing is left, right? Greed. Hmm. We need to pray for more giving hearts. Most of the world, two-thirds of the world, lives on how much a day? Two dollars a day. Why don't you go ahead, make out your monthly budget, 60 bucks. How far would you get? Not very far. We wouldn't even be able to have enough gas for the month, would we? Two, two, listen, two dollars a day, the majority of the world. Two-thirds of the world do not have running water. Isn't that amazing? The majority of the world spends their entire day in trying to gather food and prepare that food for that day. And they only have one meal a day. I have trouble struggling to eat three and no more. I'm a snacker, are you? (laughs) And and today it just came to me, it's my free day. (laughs) (laughs) But giving... Now, listen to me. 
2% tithe? The average church, and we're no exception, 20% of you carry this church. Now, I don't know who you are. I just know that the administrator, Miss Diane, at the end of the year, she gives me a list of how many giving units, not a name, just a number, one through whatever. And these are the people that have given to the church, and this is what they gave for the year. And so I look at that, and I do an analysis. And we're not doing much better than anybody else out there. But for the 20% of you that carry the 80% of this budget of this church, I thank you. Why? God gave you a gift of giving. You know? Now, when we talk about this gift of giving, is it just giving your tithe? No. no. This gift of giving is given bountifully, above and beyond. I used to go to a camp, a Christian camp, every summer in Canandaigua. It was called Laterno Christian Camp. Anybody know who Laterno was? Yeah. I'm sorry? Caterpillar. Big earth-moving equipment. He was a multimillionaire, right? Very wealthy man. But he purposed to give away 90% of his wealth and only kept 10. Yes, you would like to have that 10. I know you. <laughs> but, but he was such a giving man, and he gave to missions and missionaries, and he built Christian camps all over the world, all over the country. Just, I mean, he had a gift of giving. And he gave hilariously, generously, bountifully. That's what he's talking about here. That's this gift. It's not giving what is required in your time. No, it's above and beyond that. Give with liberality, give exceedingly, bountifully. He who leads, now this is ruling or leading or governing with diligence. What does this mean, diligence? With, with boldness, with quickness, with speed, with, with assurance. Too many of our leaders are too timid, aren't they? Yeah. Boy, oh boy, we need some leadership in this country today, don't we? Some men who would lead. Hmm? But in the church, there should be leaders who are being decisive in what they believe and in, in the rulings and the exercise of their administrative duties. That's what he's referring to here. Paul was certainly that sort. He who shows mercy with cheerfulness. Yeah. You pray for the gift of mercy? I pray for the gift of mercy all the time. My strength is not on mercy. <laughs> How about yours? No, it's not natural to us, is it? No, no. Showing mercy and forgiveness, tender hardness, forgiving one another. Peter thought he was really approaching success when he said, Lord, how many times should I forgive my brother? Seven times seven? Yeah. And what did the Lord say? Innumerable. Don't ever stop forgiving. Every time your brother, your sister asks forgiveness, what should you say? I forgive you. Even if they don't ask, forgive them anyway. Yeah. Forgiveness only takes one. Reconciliation, all parties involved, right? Yeah. By the way, if you're married, there's a little booklet that Gail and I have been through a couple times. 27. It's Norman Wise is the author, and it's Learning to Love in 27 Days, and it goes through these different aspects of loving one another. It's a good little book. Norman Wise, 20, learn, 27 days learning how to love one another and what he's going to say from now on. Let love, true love, the fruit of the Spirit, be without hypocrisy, without wax, right? Be genuine and sincere. Abhor what is evil. And that's what you really need to ask yourself, and particularly in our culture, it's so fallen. You need to ask yourself, what is it I find acceptable that God says is detestable? Ask that question. You'll be shocked when he gives you the answer. But then you must obey, right? And take those detestable things and remove them from your life. Abhor what is evil. Cling to what is good. Hang on to the good like the woman who clung to the hem of his garment. Hmm? Asking for that grace of healing. Be kindly affectionate to one another. Again, the fruit of the Spirit. Kindness, goodness. With brotherly love, giving honor and preference to one another, right? Seeking the well-being of others, even above and beyond ourselves. Esteeming others higher than our own selves. Jesus came as the younger. What did that mean? It was younger in birth order? What does it mean when it says that it describes him as being the younger? That he came in humility. 
that he came as the least, that he offered his life upon the cross. You know what a shame it was for him to be naked upon the cross? It was a curse. But he did that for our sake, for his love for us, and how we're to love one another. Not lagging in diligence, fervent in spirit, <laughs> boiling hot spiritually is what the text really says here. Are you hot spiritually or have you become lukewarm? Jesus said, if you're lukewarm, I'll... Vomit you out. Yes, that's right. That's the word, vomit you out of my mouth. He said, I wish that you were... Hot. Or... Cold. Right. We cold is good? Yes. Yes. What's coming? Summer. And the hot days of July and August... That's the most difficult time for this northerner to take down here. It gets so hot, and boy, all this butter fat starts to melt on me, <laughs> man. And I just, I, no, I'm telling you the truth you now, you know, and, and when I get out there working and I'm cutting grass, you know, getting her done, I come in and get a cold glass of water. You know how refreshing that is? Or Pastor Ritt likes a cold shower. Oh, Refreshing. That's what he says, I wish that you were cold or hot. hot. Now, what's hot? Therapeutic. Therapeutic. Boy, you know, doing all that work out there and you strain something, especially as we get older. Boy, everything starts to hurt, you know. P.O.D., right? What's P.O.D.? Pain. pain of the day. You know, you get my age, there's a different pain every day, a different part of the body. But nothing feels better than getting a hot tub, right? You like to soak in Epsom salts, get all that magnesium in your body, and oh, boy, how it heals up. It's therapeutic. Listen, that's how God wants us. Fervent in spirit. Therapeutic and refreshing. Cold can be refreshing. Hot can be so therapeutic, can it? Yeah. Are you that to one another? Are you? Patient, long-suffering, displaying kindness, goodness? Hmm? Yeah. These, listen, these are all gifts from the Holy Spirit. Verse 12. Rejoicing in the hope. The hope. It's a specific hope. What hope are you rejoicing in? He's coming for me. You've been wearing your t-shirts? Everybody got their t-shirts? Normal's not coming back, but Jesus is. On the other side it says, are you ready? Are you ready? That's our blessed hope. That's the hope. I'm rejoicing in that hope. Why? This world is falling apart, but we know it's all coming together. It's all coming together. Yeah. yeah. None of us have it all together, but all together? Yeah. We have it all. Patient in tribulation. That's otherwise called long. Oh, boy, yeah. Only God can give you that, right? The ability to suffer long, but with rejoicing in the process, having joy. Mm. Continuing steadfastly in. Yeah. What aspect, what part of the church in the world is really known for prayer? The Asian church. South Korea in particular. Largest church, largest Christian church in the world is in Seoul, South Korea. And they're open 24 hours a day, seven days a week for prayer. They have lines of people waiting to get in the church and pray at 3 o'clock in the morning. We're going to have a prayer time. When? Next Sunday night, 6 o'clock here. We'll have such a crowd, I don't know if we'll be able to contain you all. Will that be true? Well, I hope so, but I don't think so. The least attended meeting of the church? Why? When it's the most powerful activity that we participate in, right? So we're at the table just yesterday morning. And you know how cloudy it was yesterday morning? You know, the, the rain clouds, and it was kind of gloomy. And, and we're talking, and then we start praying. And she said, Lord, I just, I just want a little ray of sunshine today. All of a sudden, boom, this, this ray of sunshine come through the light, boom, right on her face. <laughs> True story. I said, wow, don't let me cross you. <laughs> You got a direct line. <laughs> Wednesday night, we had a fellow visiting, and, and I talked to him afterwards. He lost his job. And there's nothing more, nothing more depressing for a man than to lose his ability to provide the income for his family. Nothing more devastating. Anybody ever been laid off? Men? Yeah, I have. And it really is. It's heartbreaking. It leaves you kind of feeling hollow. And so immediately, I wanted to pray for him. So I prayed for him. And then he 
got in touch with me and said Thursday morning he got a call and he got a job offer. No, it wasn't my prayers. It was just the Lord. But what does he want us to do? He wants us to pray one for another. You know, the most powerful thing we can do is pray. People say, well, at least I can pray. Well, at least. That's the best thing you can do is to pray, right? I pray that the Lord makes us a praying church more than ever before. I pray we become like the church in Asia. The Asian people know they're so humble. You know the difference between Asian people and the West? Westerners, we celebrate our individuality, individuality, our independence. Boy, we, right? Well, what do they celebrate? Their communion, their community, their oneness. That's why they're so moved to pray for one another, because they fervently love one another. They're in the community. One suffers, they all suffer. One rejoices, they all rejoice. There's too much of an individual spirit, right, in the West? We need to have more of that communal spirit where we truly do pray for one another, love one another. I need to wrap this up. Distributing to the needs of the saints and given to hospitality. Yeah. Bless those who persecute you. Bless and do not curse. Rejoice with those who rejoice and weep with those who weep. Be of the same mind towards one another. And do not set your mind on high things. A couple of young men in my life, I had to warn them not to get involved in politics. There was a group of people trying to encourage my son to run for politics in North Carolina. And I gave him a very strong exhortation not to do that. Why? Politics is a dirty, dirty business. And what happens is you you start to put your mind on high things, you know. And then it becomes your goal or your, your pursuit, then you'll compromise many, many good things for the pursuit of that high thing. No. Jesus came and he said, birds of the air have, foxes have, I don't even have a bed. I don't even own a bed, he said. I have nowhere to lay my head. Hmm. Don't set your mind on high things, but associate with the humble. Do not be wise in your own opinion. Don't be conceited. Be open to learn new things and be open to the fact that we might be wrong in some of our opinions. I always say, well, have you considered? You know, I don't try to tell people what to believe, but have you considered this? Or have you thought about this? Have you ever given this any thought? And that's a good way to approach it, you know? But we all should want to be learning, right? When my wife and I go somewhere, I say, honey, let's just be quiet. Why? Why? Because you have two ears and one mouth, and you learn a whole lot more by than you do by you just repeat what you know, right? Yeah. I don't know what I was this morning, but this is 200 plus pounds of ignorance. That's what I do know about myself. No, really, really. The more you know, the more you realize you don't know. You don't know. So have that humble attitude about it. And if it is possible, as much as depends upon you, live peaceably with all men. Yeah, don't you hate division? Don't you hate when we're separated? We have to do everything we can to live at peace. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall see God. See God. Jesus came to bring peace. He said, I come to bring peace, but unfortunately, also a sword, the sword of his word, that his word would divide, that the truth would divide. But even there, we're trying to draw, build a bridge where we can bring them across onto our side of a way of thinking to the truth, right? So live at peace with all men as much as is within your power. Sometimes you can't, but you try. You make that attempt, okay? We're to be known as peacemakers. Beloved, do not avenge yourself, but rather give place to wrath. For it is written, vengeance is mine, I will repay, saith the Lord. Every devil and every saint, and you can rest in that. Yeah. Therefore, if your enemy hungers, feed him. If he thirsts, give him a drink. You know how many of the Ukrainian families have opened up their homes for the Russian soldiers? They know these boys are trapped. They're, you know, many of them don't want to be there. I was watching a Russian, uh, uh, an Ukrainian uh, woman, older woman, berating a soldier, a Russian soldier. She's standing right in front of their, arm, their armored vehicle, and he starts crying. He starts crying. They don't want to be there. They don't want to be doing that. They're loving their enemies. 
You know, they even collected the bodies. The other, I don't know, if, do you know anything about the reports where they were collecting all the bodies of the Russian soldiers so they could offer them back to their families to put them at rest? How respectful. How Christian. For in doing so, you will heap coals of fire upon their head. Is that a judgment? No, that was a blessing. You, what would happen, he would bring a little jar, and you had a fire started, and so he wanted to start a fire at his camp. So he'd come over and say, Austin, can I take a few of those coals? Sure you can. And you put the coals in the jar, you put the jar in your head, and you go back to your camp, and you start a fire. So it was a blessing. It wasn't a judgment or a curse. Some people misunderstand that verse. And do not, do not be overcome evil by evil, but overcome evil always. Always you can overcome evil with good. Where would you need to overcome that evil more than any place else? In your own heart. In your own heart. Yesterday we were talking about besetting sins. And you can have a besetting sin that's been going on in your life for some time. And why, why is it it's still a besetting sin? Why is it that it's still there? Because you want it to be and you haven't overcome it with good. God will take it when you're really done with it, when you're really offering it to him. But how do I overcome the evil? Good. And, and the only reason why you'll go to evil is because you feel it's meeting some need in your life. Is that correct? But it's getting a need met inappropriately, like drinking water from a cesspool. No. When you realize you can get that need met in abundance through Christ, the good, that overcomes the evil, right? Yeah, it is the goodness of God that leads to repentance. Amen? Yeah. Shall we stand? Pastor David?